Okay, welcome everybody. Welcome back from lunch. So we've had uh, decades of people talking about, you know, the lowest power design, the, the uh, um, you know, how we can save all of this, you know, use microwatts and so on and so forth. We got a completely different talk coming up right here. And you know what, it has nothing to do with IoT, you know, which is, you know, amazing, right? So, so many of our talks, I mean, IoT is the, the killer app that everyone's talking about. But instead, what we're gonna learn about is how to uh, deliver very, very high amounts of power, extremely efficiency with no waste. My good friend Dinesh is gonna talk to you about a totally new kind of transistor that uh, can be used to uh, convert power from one form to another without wasting any of it. Dinesh. So I'm, I'm gonna spend most of the time talking to you about power electronics with vertical GAN devices. Uh, and then given that this is a, an EDA audience, the idea would be to actually tell you why you would actually care about something like this. Um, so let me, um, let me jump into the, into, the, into the middle of the talk. So this is kind of a, a quick overview of what I'm gonna be talking to you about. So the first thing would be, you know, what's the problem statement, what problem are we trying to solve, and why do we really care about power? Um, the, the, the next one will be to talk about what's the state of the art in terms of power devices that are available today uh, and what are their limitations because obviously everything that's around has some sort of limitation or the other. Um, the next one will be to talk about the advantage of, of gallium nitride power transistors uh, and how they actually work inside systems. So that's, uh, and then in the end, why does this community sort of care about, about these very specific problems that, uh, that we're going into. So, okay, so let's, let's start from the very beginning. Um, power systems are, are there everywhere. Um, what is a power system? A power system is any system that converts power from one form to the other. So anything that you get from your wall socket is AC power. Uh, anything that you're driving that's electronic, every chip that's made is driven by DC power. So you have to convert AC into DC. And then inside your, um, inside your system, you typically have to do DC to DC conversions as well where you're taking voltages from, let's say, 48 volt outside to 12 volt or three volts to uh, uh, 2.5 volts to drive USB or 5.5 volts to basically give USB bus output. Uh, and then there's DC to AC conversions where you're looking at solar, um, where you have uh, solar panels which basically produce DC power, but then in order to put them into the grid, you have to convert it into AC. So you convert DC into AC and then you push that into the grid. So this is, this is what power systems are all about. Um, and power systems are there everywhere. 95% um, of, of power systems are made out of something called, or are switch mode power supplies. Um, and you know, in, in short form, we'll refer to them as SMPS, but I'll sometimes use that interchangeably. So switch mode power supplies were inve invented in the 1980s, lots of papers, uh, textbooks, books, whole bunch of other things that I've written. Um, the, the main push with uh, switch mode power supplies was for uh, enabling mobile computing, which is uh, your laptops, um, now your cell phones. So um, you have power converters in your, in your, I mean, for your laptop where you have this little brick that you carry along with you, uh, which takes AC power and then uses that to charge the battery that you're talking about. Uh, you have these little, little bricks that you're carrying around with you to charge your cell phones as your battery kind of runs out. Uh, these are also all AC DC converters of, of some kind or the other. So inside the middle of every switch mode power supply, um, you have a uh, transistor or a switch, which is why they're called switch mode power supplies. Um, those transistors or switches are typically made out of silicon and they operate at about 600 volts. Um, the reason they operate at 600 volts is uh, there's a little bit of math and things around it. Um, in the US, you have 110 volt that comes out from the line. Uh, in countries like uh, India and in the UK, you have 240 volts that come out from the line. When you rectify that, you get something like 390 odd volts. And then uh, all the power engineers add 50% uh, on top of that to basically get you a 600 volt device. And that also allows you to take care of spikes and all these other interesting things that happen on the power line. So, um, so for silicon, um, superjunction MOSFETs, uh, were invented again in the, in the early 80s and they've actually made a huge um, amount of, of progress in them. Uh, they're typically less than or equal to 600 volts. 
Uh, and then IGBTs or insulated gate bipolar transistors are used for anything that's greater than 600 volts. So 1,200 volt devices, 1,500 volt devices. Now, the problem with silicon is that it's not the best material for power electronics. It's great, it's great when it comes to low voltage transistors, uh, but it's actually quite bad when it comes to high voltage devices. So you have these two architectures, a MOSFET and an IGBT, when you're scaling the 600 volt barrier, and that itself is problematic because you can't have circuits that you implemented when you were doing less than 600 volts to scale to higher than 600 volts. So there's an inherent issue there. Uh, second issue is uh, switching frequency. So MOSFET 600 volts, max switching frequency you can get to is about 200 kilohertz. Um, obviously, when we work with ICs, we are looking at transistors that are much smaller, one volt that can switch at gigahertz switching frequencies. But as you dump the voltage up, the switching frequency goes down quite dramatically. IGBTs are even worse. The maximum switching frequency you can get there is about 20 kilohertz. So the size of the power supply is actually defined by the transistor that you end up using in it, and the switching frequency defines the amount of heat actually that, get, that gets generated inside the device, and therefore the size um, of the power supply is, is determined by the transistor and the switching frequency. Um, so why is that important? That's important because the entire power supply, when it, when it converts AC into DC, um, is putting out a certain amount of heat, and that heat is captured in the envelope, which is defined by the size of that power supply. So what you want to try to do is make sure that you come up with devices that are um, much better in their heat dissipation, so you can get significantly more efficient systems, you can shrink the size of power supplies, uh, and make the power supply significantly more efficient. All right, so um, what we really need uh, is a high voltage, high frequency switch, and this is considered to be the holy grail of power electronics. So what are the, uh, some of the um, power systems that are available in the market today? So you have power systems that go into data centers, power systems that go into solar inverters, power systems for automotive cars, um, you know, electric car motors, they're all induction motors now, uh, and electric car chargers because you have a big battery and you actually need to uh, make sure that those batteries are charged. Um, on the industrial front, you have industrial motors, which are pumps, um, elevators, which basically also use pumps to push things back and forth. Um, in case you were wondering, one third of pretty much all energy that's consumed in the United States uh, is used by motors. So making motors efficient means you need lesser power plants to actually power the same number of motors. So that's one of the most important things. So I, I put one example out here. Um, so if you look at a 100 watt uh, power supply, uh, this is for the laptop chargers, which pretty much all of you carry in your bag. If you look at a 100, 100 watt power supply and you can make the power supply 86% efficient, which is what they are right now in the ones that you're carrying, and move it to 93% efficiency, that's 7% improvement. And if you have 50 million such laptops that are connected into the wall socket at, at any given point in time, you're looking at a total of 350 megawatts worth of savings. Right? So these numbers are, are gigantic, and this is just one application. So now if you took motors and you're able to improve motor efficiency by, let's say, 4 or 5 percent, um, you could not need any more uh, power plants. You could actually use the same amount of energy that we are consuming today and do many, many more interesting things with it. So this is one of the reasons why you know, power is really, really important. And uh, what we are trying to do is can we create a scalable high voltage, high frequency power transistor that allows us to maybe go from this 86 percent to 93 percent overall. So that's, that's kind of what the, what the premise of what we're bringing to the table is. So the, the basic underlying uh, trend here is that since silicon is not the right material to actually use for um, these high voltage and high frequency transistors, what is the next best material? So there's a compound semiconductor, and the reason it's compound is it's because it's a combination of, of two um, elements, gallium in this case and nitride or nitrogen in the other. Um, and that, by the definitions that I'm showing you on the screen, is really the best uh, material to use uh, for, for making power devices. So what are, the, what are the axes that you typically look at? Axis number one is something called band gap. Uh, the way to think about this is the amount of energy to sort of knock the last electron out of, your, out of the orbit. Um, the critical electrical field, um, critical electrical field is when you're looking at a device, you want to know what is the electrical field that a junction can actually withstand before it breaks down? So all transistors are made out of some kind of PN junctions or the other. It sort of takes you back, you know, way, way back to uh, physics 101. 
Um, and then when you multiply these numbers, you look at something called the beleaguer figure of Merrick, um, which basically says that gallium nitride is about 3,000 times better than, than what you can do with, with silicon. Um, I, I won't run through you know, why those things are important because there's a, a fair bit of physics that sort of goes into, into that. But generally, the idea is uh, if I compare silicon to gallium nitride, gallium nitride is way better. Then, of course, the, the challenges are even more interesting. So if I have gallium nitride, uh, that's all fine and dandy, but how do I actually make devices out of gallium nitride material? So there's three ways in which you can make gallium nitride devices. They fall into the following categories. You can make gallium nitride on silicon, which is you take a, a silicon wafer, and then you grow gallium nitride crystals on, on top of that. You can make gallium nitride on silicon carbide, which is you take a silicon carbide wafer, and then you grow gallium nitride on top of it. And then the third one, which is you take gallium nitride wafers, and then you grow gallium nitride on top of that. So when you grow gallium nitride on gallium nitride, you grow something called homo epitaxy, which is you're making the same material growth. And that's usually considered the best type of uh, um, growth that you can get and the best type of transistors that you can make with it. So all the column, all, all the rows here are the various uh, mechanisms that you would look at um, in order to judge which type of material is, is best. And uh, if you paid attention to it, then the column which says true GAN or the gallium nitride on gallium nitride is, is usually the best. Um, and that's, that's what we've been doing in the company that, uh, uh, that I run, which is making uh, devices um, with gallium nitride. So taking that to the, to the next level, um, I just thought it would be good to sort of compare um, how silicon devices work today, um, how big the market for silicon is, just to give you an idea, because sometimes people forget where these devices get used and how many billion dollars worth of stuff is actually sold for power. Um, and then also to talk to you a little bit about where the limitations are. So in this chart, uh, and I'll, I'll use the same chart again for, uh, for all devices. So the little device on the, on the corner there uh, is basically a, a, a simple transistor. Um, it's a power transistor in the sense that the beta is very, very high. What, what does that mean? It means that between the source and drain, you have a very large voltage, which is what you're trying to block. Uh, and then the gate, you apply a small voltage to actually open the, uh, to open the transistor up so that it conducts current in one direction. You apply the reverse voltage and it actually shuts the gate off. So it's a very simple way of looking at it. Um, we all you know, implement gates, but we implement them much more uh, digitally, which is just on or off. In this case, there's, there's an analog version of that, and you guys kind of know that too. Um, so the, the, the chart basically has the x-axis, which is switching frequency, uh, and the y-axis, which is breakdown voltage. Right? So it's the voltage that you apply uh, between the source and the drain, and the switching frequency is the frequency by which you can turn on or turn off the gate, which allows you to conduct current at that particular voltage through the device. So when you look at uh, superjunction MOSFETs, um, the, the TAM for something like this, where devices are greater than 600 volts, $1.6 billion worth of, of stuff is sold. Uh, the typical ASP for something like this is about a dollar. So you can think that 1.6 billion units are sold every year. Right? I mean, just to give you the scale of, of uh, how these devices are actually sold. And I'm not including devices that are included inside other ICs and whatnot. These are standalone devices just by themselves, 1.6 billion. Um, the superjunction MOSFETs that are less than 600 volts, 4.6 billion of these are sold. And the ASPs for those are about also in the $1 range. So there's $4.6 billion or units worth of these devices that, that get sold throughout the world. Just to give you the understanding of you know, how, how large and prolific this entire industry is, which, you know, in which very little has been done in the last 30 years. Okay, so from there we can jump into um, insulated gate bipolar transistors. Um, there's $3.1 billion worth of these transistors that are sold every year, and uh, um, th their rough ASP is about between two and two and a half dollars. So that's $1.5 billion uh, worth of, of, of units are, that are actually sold in addition to all the other numbers that you looked at. So this is a huge, huge market, and uh, these different devices are, are used for different applications in this particular space. So the restriction on a, sil on a silicon IGBT is that on the frequency side, it's limited because of its, uh, of its capacitance, and on the voltage side, it's actually limited based on the band gap that you have, so you can't actually push this too much higher. Um, then there are uh, devices that are made out of another compound semiconductor called silicon carbide. 
and the silicon carbide devices is, are basically limited based on the material properties in terms of switching frequencies, but they can actually get significantly higher um, breakdown voltages. However, from a cost perspective, they're actually never pushed in the lower than 600 volt arena. And you can see the, the, the SOM here, or there's only $300 million worth of this actually that's sold. Um, then remember, I, I talked about growing GAN on, on silicon. So people make something called a HEMT, or a high electron mobility transistor. Um, it's about $100 million. You can actually get very high switching frequency, but they haven't been able to push the breakdown voltage up here. Um, whereas by doing GAN on GAN, you actually are able to address this entire market. You can get significantly bigger breakdown voltages, significantly higher switching frequencies. In fact, devices that we have done, uh, we've actually switched at about four, four and a half uh, megahertz switching frequency uh, and uh, running them at about 2,000 um, all the way up to about 4,000 volts of, uh, of voltage. So this, this uh, type of device basically addresses a very, very large market. And if you say $2 ASP, you're looking at you know, being able to make two odd uh, billion units to, to address this space. Okay, so what do these devices look like? Now I'm, I'm showing you charts which are uh, maybe a little too deep uh, in terms of how these devices work, but let's just do a quick look here. So on, on this device, you're looking at that being the gate, that being the source, and this being the drain. Um, the gate in this one is, is, is over here. The source is over there. The drain is actually at the bottom. And then this is a SEM, or a scanning electron microscope picture of exactly the same thing, but implemented in, in real life, right? So you have uh, the via, which is over there. You have source metal, which is that guy. You have um, the, the where I've written this yellow stuff is basically where the drain is. And then you have the, the P gate at the bottom, which basically pinches off this channel, which is where the current flows through. Right, so it's a, uh, the one on the top is a cartoon, the one below is actually a realization of, of exactly that, that cartoon. Okay, um, so charts with some numbers. Um, now, why is this important? Um, it's important because when you're making a transistor, there are two things that you really care about a transistor. So number one is something called uh, its output capacitance, and number two is something called its reverse recovery voltage, um, or its reverse recovery charge. Um, so why do you care about these two? So output capacitance is when you look at the device, you wanna try to understand what the capacitance of that device looks like, because that's what you can switch. So the lower the capacitance, the faster you can switch it, the higher the capacitance, the slower you'll be able to switch it. And also the more energy that's actually dissipated when you try to switch it. Um, the QRR or the reverse recovery charge is when you turn the device off, how much energy is dissipated in turning that device off and is there any ringing that actually happens? So when the device is off, is it really off like your, like your door? You know, it doesn't really latch, it sort of you know, shudders and then gets into a latch situation. So you're trying to look at how much energy is dissipated when you turn the device on and when you turn the device off. So those are really the two big parameters that you look at. So those are the two numbers in this column right here. So if you look at, this is a device that we make out of gallium nitride. Um, the capacitance is 10 picofarads, right? So picofarad is really, 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 really tiny for a 1,200 volt 10 amp um, device. And you can compare all the others where silicon is you know, significantly higher, the silicon carbide MOSFET is lower, um, and then people actually use a silicon carbide diode um, to connect it like this. It's called an anti-parallel diode. They connect it just to reduce the overall output capacitance of, of the, uh, the QRR, the reverse recovery uh, of that device. Um, so the, the reason to show this is that there's significant advantages to making these devices where the output capacitances are significantly lower and the QRR or the reverse recovery charge is significantly lower as well. And those have huge implications in the circuits that you end up, end up making with them. Um, when those two numbers are much higher, the devices or the circuits that you can make are very different um, and they're very restricted compared to what you could do when you have uh, very, very slow um, output capacitance and, and very low uh, uh, reverse recovery charge. So the next question that obviously everybody pops up, okay, if that device is that great, you know, how much does it cost? Um, you know, how small are these devices so that I can get some, you know, understanding of, of what you're talking about in terms of capacitance. So this chart, um, puts together on the x-axis, because uh, this is a complicated issue, because on the x-axis you're looking at size of wafers, so this is a four-inch wafer, six-inch wafer, eight-inch wafer, and 12-inch wafers. 
Um, and on the y-axis, you're looking at die size of these different devices that we were talking to you about. So here's a 1,200-volt 20-amp device. It's 2.25 millimeters squared. Uh, a 1,200-volt 22-amp device in silicon is 27.2 millimeters squared. So these are actually just to, just to give you a comparison of how big the die are, um, you know, in terms of what typical uh, wafer size people are, are working with. So um, silicon typically works with either 8-inch or 12-inch wafers. Um, gallium nitride on silicon is, is working between 6 and 8, so they are actually on 6 inch, moving to 8 inches. Uh, silicon carbide is at 6 inches, so you can see the, the, the die size for those. And then if you needed to then compute, saying, you know, is it cost effective to, to do a computation, then you tend to look at this table, which is really, really complicated at the bottom, and I won't spend too much time on it. But effectively what it says is that, you know, these costs are sort of comparable, even if you look at uh, wafers that are four inches versus wafers that are eight or 12 inches for silicon. Um, you look at yield, you look at uh, uh, total area that you're looking at and what those, uh, uh, what those costs will, be, will end up being. So we come up with costs that are actually competitive with silicon based on equivalent functionality. And when I say that, I, I typically mean when you're looking at similar devices, but um, uh, with uh, similar devices with similar functionality. Okay. So why do we care about these in, uh, in power systems, right? So I'll, I'll sort of try to walk you through these one by one. So um, the first one is, um, is high voltage and uh, high switching frequency. So what is high voltage? So power, I mean, you all know, uh, just first order Ohm's law, right? Power is voltage times current. So the same power you can actually realize with two different voltages, one lower voltage and one higher voltage then with the higher voltage, you reduce the total amount of current that actually runs through the, through the circuit. So that's kind of what that says. So if you're then looking at losses for a one kilowatt system, you can implement it either 200 volt and five amp or 1,000 volt and one amp. Uh, and obviously the, the power loss in, in both cases is very different based on the total amount of current that's actually running in the, in the system. The second one is the GAN die is typically 30 times smaller than the silicon die. Therefore, the capacitances are lower, capacitances are lower uh, the amount of switching or the amount of energy that you dissipate in switching is significantly lower. Uh, therefore, those devices are actually better to implement higher voltage systems. The, 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 the second one is that when you're looking at, so you have two choices. Either you run something at higher frequency or you try to run it at, at, uh, at higher efficiency. So with these type of devices, you can actually have a trade-off. You can basically say, I'm willing to live with exactly the same efficiency that I have right now, but I'm running at higher switching frequency. And if I did that, I can actually shrink the size of these systems. Or I can choose to run it at lower switching frequency, but increase the efficiency of, of the system by running things at higher voltage. So you have these two choices that you can actually play around with, and that becomes part of what a power designer or a power circuit designer would end up, end up using it at. So higher frequency, um, sorry. So what, why, do you, why do you care about higher frequency? So at, at higher frequency, all magnetics become smaller, uh, all storage elements inside circuit. So inductors become significantly smaller, um, capacitors become significantly smaller. You can actually get rid of them as your, as your circuit moves forward. And because you make them smaller, um, you're able to, um, you know, your cost comes down, your, um, the total amount of area that you're using becomes significantly smaller as well. So this is one of the reasons why people push for higher frequency uh, switches. The third one is uh, there's something called avalanche. Um, and why is this important? It's, it's because, um, so uh, transistor theory 101. So there are three states in which a transistor operates. Um, you know, there's the uh, saturated state, there's the linear state, and then there's this avalanche state. So avalanche state is where a device sort of goes into, in quote, destructive mode or um, um, into a mode in which the device can actually pretend like it's failing, but it doesn't, it actually can come back from there. So avalanche is a state in which you can actually push your devices into, uh, but it will actually recover from that device. It doesn't break down uh, in, in an avalanche state. So that's exceedingly important because power systems are always uh, subject to um, different types of uh, variations that happen on the line. And if your device actually has avalanche in it, then it can absorb some of this energy uh, and then not, uh, not be destroyed, but actually come back from uh, from these high energy pulses in for short periods of time. Okay, so let's talk about very specific um, examples with the value propositions that I kind of talked about before. So electric cars, uh, we've been able to show that 
with the devices that we are coming up with, putting them into uh, inverters that take DC power from the battery and convert it into AC power to drive the induction motor at the other end, uh, we can actually give 20% performance improvement. Uh, what does that mean? It means with the same battery, you can actually get 20% more um, driving distance in the same car. So this is a huge value proposition for uh, pretty much everybody in the, in the car industry. And you, know, you can see the folks that will actually um, will talk about this kind of stuff. Um, servers and data centers. Um, because we're able to reduce the total amount of power that's needed in these, in these servers, we can take a, a, a five megawatt, uh, 5,000 server um, data center and actually make it significantly more efficient um, by coming out with a, with a saving of about a million dollars per year uh, for that particular data center. So again, this is a huge deal because typically data centers are, are now running at not five uh, megawatts, but you know, 500 megawatts. So this is like a hundred million dollar uh, savings for such a big data center that you know, the guys at the bottom typically end up deploying. Uh, third one is solar inverters. Um, so in the solar inverter space, it's all about cost. So um, things have become so cheap at this point in time that the uh, cost of, uh, of inverter uh, per watt of energy uh, is actually more dominant than the cost of the panel uh, per watt of energy that it actually ends up providing. So by running these inverters at significantly higher switching frequency, you can actually shrink their size. And by shrinking their size, you get rid of a whole bunch of components or you make these components significantly lesser in value. Uh, and that's the, the value proposition that you bring in. So we've done some experiments that allow us to show that 20% of the cost can actually be lowered uh, for, a solar, for a solar inverter. Either it's a, um, um, a, a mini inverter or a string inverter as well. So it's, it's, a, it's a big deal for, for these industries. So um, the last and, and final sort of view of, of where things fall at is you can have these devices that actually run at high switching frequencies, but you also need circuits that need to go along with them. So a lot of innovation we've done as a, as a company in order to make sure that uh, the circuits come along with the devices. So, because um, here's, here's the issue that you don't want to run into. Um, if we run into our customers and we tell them, oh, we got a device that actually does significantly better than the device that you're using right now, then our customer will come in and tell us, oh gee, that's fine, can you give it to me at the same price point or the lower price point than what I'm buying those devices right now because I want to take those old devices, put your devices in its place. And that's really not what we want to do because these devices are significantly more uh, beneficial uh, to our end customers. So we have to make our customers understand what type of circuits they can actually use that fully exploit these devices that we're providing to them. So part of what we have done is a whole bunch of work on high, high frequency circuits. And typically these high frequency circuits are what one calls resonant circuits. Um, resonant circuits are, are circuits where you don't have square, square shaped forms um, because square shaped forms typically end up dissipating more energy than circuits that sort of run um, you know, resonant to their natural switching frequency. So there's a, there's a bunch of work when you combine these two things together then you get a power platform that actually goes across all these areas that we just talked about, be it electric cars, uh, electric motors, um, solar inverters, data centers, and, and anything else that, that you can think of that needs power. So um, there's a bunch of work we've done. So this is a, a, a plug for, you know, obviously the things we've done inside the company right now. So we've been at it for about four years. Um, these devices are, are made. We've actually sampled them to a whole bunch of customers. Um, we've run huge reliability tests on them because power systems are sort of the heart of every system. You have to make sure that the subsystems that you put together with these devices are exceedingly reliable. Um, so we've run you know, standard 1,000-hour tests on pretty much all the devices that we've put out, uh, and we don't see any, any fallouts or any issues in them. Uh, and then cost-effective, I sort of showed you a first-order look at you know, what the, the cost um, between our devices um, other 3.5 uh, devices and, and what the silicon devices are in the marketplace. Now, why does this matter to all the people here, right? The reason this is important is this is one of the other innovations that actually um, are coming to the forefront. And I'll, I'll sort of try to make an analogy with this. So if you guys listened to Art's talk earlier, uh, Art was basically talking about um, AI or machine learning. Uh, which is something that uh, I took when I was a, a graduate student in, in, in UC Irvine. And uh, you know, we talked about uh, you know, hierarchical neural networks. And at that time, everybody kind of understood what it did, but nobody could implement it and actually realize full-blown systems from it, primarily because we didn't have the compute power to do that. Um, now you have the compute power to do it, and therefore 
you know, AI or machine learning is actually taking this, this huge leap forward and, and enabling us to do things that we didn't think possible uh, but are computationally acceptable at this point in time. This technology is something similar. The high-speed circuits that I'm talking to you about, they were all invented in the, in the 80s. It's just you didn't have a device that you could run at these high switching frequencies that will allow you to implement these circuits. So we're coming to a point where that is now going to be, going to be possible and that will fundamentally disrupt or change the world of power electronics. Uh, why? For the, for the reasons that I've actually tried to list down here. So you will now need new controllers. So the old controllers were all based for silicon devices which were switching at less than 100 kilohertz switching frequency. You're now looking at different controllers that you will need for devices that run at you know, multi megahertz switching frequencies. Um, you, now need to, you now need to manage inductances on the board, right, and even in packages, which is something that people really don't care about. But if you're running at multi megahertz switching frequency, your wire, your bond wire, is suddenly going to start making an impact onto your circuit. So you need to be able to simulate that. You need to be able to understand what impact these things are going to have. Your traces on the board are suddenly going to start making, uh, you know, uh, interesting changes in your, in your circuit design if you don't pay attention to the thickness of those uh, and the length of those wires as well. So with high frequency uh, power switching, there's a whole slew of things that are going to just open up uh, for this industry to spend a whole bunch of, of time and effort on. Um, same thing with high voltages. I mean, you need to, you need to know what is the minimum trace length difference, uh, how far can you keep two traces, how close can you keep two traces, because if you keep them too far, then you're wasting board space to keep them too close. You know, you're, worry, you're worried about arcing and a whole bunch of other issues that pop up when you're looking at high voltages. Um, the, the next big thing is uh, modeling of, of magnetic systems. Um, th it's it's un unbelievable for, for me to tell you that there are really no models for magnetic systems out there at all, right? So uh, everybody assumes that, you know, transformers are kind of, you know, working the way you expect them to work, but there is no model. So I can't, I can't go uh, live and change what my out input would be into a transformer and try to understand what the output is going to look like, um, you know, by dynamically varying the number of turns uh, on a transform on the primary and on the secondary. Uh, you can do it statically, but it doesn't tell you dynamically what's actually going on. So these are, these are things that become significantly more important when you're switching um, your, your devices at multi megahertz switching frequency. You need to know what the fringe flux is going to look like, uh, how much impact, you know, other things around your around your circuit are going to be in your, in, in your transformer design. So th these things will become significantly more important as, as we move forward. Um, air core becomes another very important thing. So today when you have an inductor, you have like a little piece of metal and then, you know, things kind of wrapped around it. With this, if you're running things at one or two uh, megahertz switching frequency, you don't need uh, the, the, the core in the middle at all. You can actually throw it away and this run with air as your core. Um, it drops the efficiencies, but then, you know, one needs to understand exactly what kind of impact you have, uh, be able to model that, and then figure out what small core or what, what, uh, um, what core architectures will actually give you uh, the, the, the best performance uh, in these type of systems. Um, the last one is EMI filters, right? So, so today, um, all power supplies typically run at about 100 kilohertz, and the reason they run at 100 kilohertz is if you looked at that EMI chart that typically people end up showing you, 100 kilohertz and the harmonics of 100 kilohertz is what people try to avoid the most. And that's why the EMI filters are really large because the 100 kilohertz harmonics are where uh, you find the EMI line drop in terms of the standard that you have to meet. Now, if you moved it to two megahertz switching frequency, um, you're gonna be looking at harmonics of two megahertz. So the 100 kilohertz doesn't show up at all, which means your EMI design can actually be significantly smaller, much more compact and shrink the size of these power supplies even more. So how do, how do you model these appropriately? How do you figure out you know, what type of EMI filters you need? Things that were done 30 years ago are not gonna be applicable anymore. So it, it opens up a whole new area. Uh, capacitors, we now need capacitors that can actually withstand much higher switching frequencies. So dielectrics have to change. Um, we need to be able to understand uh, or have capacitors that can actually work at much higher voltages as well. So today, uh, higher voltage capacitors are typically more expensive than low voltage capacitors you wanted to sort of go the other way around in order to be able to move this entire industry forward from, a, from an overall cost perspective. So that's kind of the, 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 the gist of what's happening in, in uh, new material sciences, new uh, devices, and you know, how that's actually pushing power electronics forward in, in, in various ways. Um, I can take some questions if you have any questions. I've kind of run out of my time already.
Yeah. Well, thank you. So when you said that uh, the resonant circuit, so is the primarily the, the switching uh, uh, signals are actually square waves, right? So that you get the um, go to saturation region, right? But if it is a, a sinusoidal waveform, right, it, it might go to active region or something like that, right? I mean, how do you? So so the, the, the way the, the device is constructed or the way the, um, the resonant circuit is constructed is the resonant circuit is basically defined by the output capacitance of the of the transistor, okay. the inductor that you're actually putting in, and the resistor that you have in parallel. So it's an RLC circuit, right? If you just let that RLC circuit run by itself, it will achieve a particular resonance frequency. Once it reaches that resonant frequency, then you have your transistor basically fire on and off and give you a sinusoidal waveform at that switching frequency. So you don't actually have a square wave at all. Because today what we do is you put a PWM right. and you make your own switching frequency with the square wave that pops up. Okay. Then when you modulate that, that square wave, you get a, you know, you get a nice uh, curved wave, but you really don't get a curved wave because the, the harmonics of, of this uh, square wave basically come in the middle. In this case, you don't have any harmonics because it's just switching you know, the way it would switch naturally. So okay. that's, that's what resonant circuits are. Okay. Okay. So I, mean I can you. spend more time if you sure, want. Thank sure, thank you. Uh, yeah. Dinesh, uh, you mentioned about uh, DC voltage from the solar panel uh, convert to AC yeah. to drive the car, yeah. induction motor. But I thought most uh, Teslas of the world, uh, EVs are all DC. Uh, yeah, motors. so the, the way the, 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 the cars work is they actually have a battery. So the, the battery is all DC. Right. Right, and then the DC from the battery is converted to AC to drive an induction motor. I thought the other way around, because DC motors give you the highest torque. And the reason that you get uh, highest torque in Tesla is because of DC motor in it. It's actually an AC motor. So oh, yeah, so almost all cars now are in the induction motor uh, category. So they're all AC motors. Um, the difference between AC motors and DC motors in terms of their performances have come s to the point where AC motors are actually just a tad bit more efficient than DC motors. A tad, so how much is tad? Two like two or, two or three percent. So oh, they're, they're, they're in that range. Okay. Right. So I, again, I can I can fill you in. So, th in fact, the the reason this actually popped up is because devices weren't there, um, you know, when the Tesla guys were actually making their induction motor. So the the sem the power semiconductor industry made a specific IGBT for Tesla, which enabled them to be able to drive an, an AC motor, you know, more efficiently than it ever had been done before. So do you mean that there are cars that are some are DC and some are AC. No, almost all of them are moving to, moving are to have moved to AC motors. Okay. Right. Okay. Yeah. Great. Thank you. Sure. Uh, thank you. Just uh, you talked a little bit about it. When you move higher frequency, you get uh, some heat impact in the passive. And yes. how, how to manage that? Because here you are advocating uh, right. much so higher frequencies. Right, so there's, there's two, two ways to manage it. So um, one is, well, th there's two ways that they get managed, right? So number one is the inductor, passives, you mean inductors, right? That's what you're, so when you run at higher voltages, the induct or hi higher frequencies, the inductors are significantly smaller. And, and the reason they're smaller is because you don't need as much storage because your quanta of power is so small that you can make the inductors much smaller. So by definition, because inductors are smaller, they dissipate significantly lesser amounts of heat, right? The same is true for capacitors as well. So if you can run them at, at higher switching frequencies, you end up dissipating lesser. The, the key thing is how much energy do you dissipate in the transformer, right? Es especially when you're going from AC to DC or, or the other way around. So that is why you need those better models that I was talking about. So you, you actually understand where the losses are gonna be. And in all our experiments, we find you know most of the losses are, are in the device rather than in the in the passive. So, thank you. Right. We got tons of questions here. All right, this is very. I have two questions. Sure. Uh, first one: uh, What are the advantages of uh, gallium nitride over gallium arsenide in uh, power electronics? Okay. So the the answer to that is um, they're totally com they're completely different, right? So. 
Um, gallium arsenide has band gap, which we kind of talked about before. Mm -hmm. It's completely different or much lower than gallium nitride does. Uh, gallium arsenide is typically used for high speed switching circuits, mm -hmm. less for power related uh, technologies. So that's, I mean, there's, there's like fundamental. Um, also chemically the they are similar. Uh, no, they're, they're very different. Okay. Yeah, so the, the crystal structure is very different. Uh -huh. The critical electric field is also very different. So that's one of the key things, yeah. Okay, another question is uh, mm, uh, when you design your chips, are you using the same methodology and the same EDA tools as for uh, silicon uh, technology? So or right now all we're designing is actually transistor and a diode and maybe putting the two things together. Okay. Uh, but when we do, do that, we use all standard silicon tools. So nothing that we're doing is you know, strange or weird, right? Because it's it's n-type material, p-type material. No, no material specific tools. No, no, n okay. nothing. So what we do is we adjust doping levels. Um, you know, in in the way we end up simulating our junctions, uh, because that's kind of how we end up determining what the the junction is going to look like, and therefore what the device is going to look like. Okay. Thank you. Sure. Okay. More questions. On the EMI emission, you mentioned about that, uh, the harmonics, right? Yeah. I mean, some of my fundamental, uh, when you do 100 kilohertz, right? The, you when especially but like in the networking or even PC, right? The 300 at maximum 400, 500 volts. And when you switch at 100 kilohertz, and the higher harmonics emission is going to be lower because your lower frequency is 100 kilohertz. But when you switch at like two megahertz or something, the energy of that frequency and that's where the EMA emission, when you actually deal with the, the standards, ULT, UV standards, right? Yeah. What is the implication actually there? Actually, it's much lower, right? So the higher uh, higher frequency you end up switching, the it's much, much lower. The the energy that you look at per pulse, right? The energy that gets, so what you're talking about is radiated energy, right? So th there's two types. There's conducted, which goes the other way into the, into the line. The second one is radiated. So when you run at higher sw switching frequency, the radiated energy per pulse is actually much lower. When you run at lower switching frequencies, then the radiated energy per pulse is actually much higher. So you have to do more work when you run at lower switching frequencies than you would if you do higher. So uh, I have some charts I can show you that too, yeah. Okay, well, uh, very interesting stuff. Um, you know, it's power supplies and uh, <laughs> that's where we start losing all of our energy and if we can stop that, uh, we have more to do uh, good stuff with. Well, so thanks thank so you. much, Dinesh. It's a pleasure. pleasure. Thank you very much.